Today, I'm speaking with Michelle Brown. Michelle, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's a privilege and an honor to be speaking with you. And just to give a quick bio for Michelle, Michelle grew up in Detroit, Michigan, and now lives in Texas with her husband. They have three adult children and several grandchildren. She went to Rochester College and Spring Arbor University, focusing on counseling psychology. She has worked in the counseling and life coaching fields. And right now, she's a full-time artist after suffering a stroke in 2021. And her art that she focuses on is abstract visual art, which is really, really cool. So uh, that's what I know about you so far, but tell us more about yourself, Michelle. <laughs> well, um, like you said, uh, so my husband and I relocated here to Texas uh, after he accepted a position here. And it was something that we were, were, were really excited about. So, and we're still happy. We love it here. Our uh, children, well, two of our uh, children are here with us and our grandbabies are here with us. And we love being here. We've met a lot of new friends and life is good now. That's awesome. <laughs> and could you just tell us before we get into your story, tell us a little bit more about your art, like what inspires you and, and what is your favorite thing to, to do with your art? How do you, how does that work? And how do you display it? Do you put it in galleries or just sell it to people or what, what how's that work? Well, it all started Tim, with uh, me texting pictures of some of the things that I create and I put, you know, positive words on it. And uh, some of my friends, actually, they all loved it. But one of my friends said, wait a minute, I'm going to print that off and put it in the frame and I'm going to put it in my office. So I called her and I said, no, the hell you're not. You're going to pay me first. <laughs> so she did. She paid me for my art. And that was my first piece of art that I actually sold. And I have been in galleries. Um, I have art in galleries right now in my city. Um, but the question is, how or why did I become an artist? Um, I, you know, write a blog. And in that um, blog, I talk about what happened that caused me to become an artist. Um, I suffered a stroke back in June 2021. And I couldn't use my left hand. So I took my right hand to make, to, I held it to make circles and squares. Mm. And one thing led to another. I decided to go to Walgreens to get some cheap paint. Cheap paint is not fun, by the way. Now that I'm an artist, I know that. <laughs> but I went and bought some paint and I started, again, you know, doing therapeutic art with myself and teaching myself how to reuse my uh, left hand. And um, after that, I kind of just fell in love with art and mm. I've been doing it ever since. And I never thought that I would have my art in a gallery or that I would be selling stuff that, you know, I create just to have fun. Yeah, so that is awesome. Well, very inspiring. I love I love hearing about how people uh, express their art or music or poetry or whatever. It's just coming out of their the, the overflow of what's going on in their lives. So that's really cool. Well, uh, at this point, I just want to say thank you again for joining us. We're here. Uh, the main part of the reason we're here is to hear your story. So if you could tell us, you know, how your journey began. How did you get exposed to Christianity? Oh, okay, y'all. Pull out, pull out your drinks. I got mine. <laughs> As my cup says, is shut the front door time. <laughs> um, so let's see, how did I find Jesus? Um uh, for me, it started back in 1975. Um, I was 10 years old. Now I'm telling my age. Don't I look beautiful? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so I was 10 years old. And the cool thing for me was my mother found Jesus. And for me, being a 10-year-old with a mother who was strung out on drugs, and she found Jesus. It was one of the happiest moments of my life and her life. So um, when my mother, she had a choice of hanging out with the family members that were into witchcraft or the ones that were into church. She chose church, and so we all ended up in church, and I'll never forget when um, she heard about the speaking in tongues thing and you know, and so that happened. And then um, I remember one morning she came into our room and she told us that she was 
breaking up with her current boyfriend at the time. And she started praying in tongues and all this. And I thought that was like the most amazing. I want to meet this Jesus. I want him. Mm -hmm. Because for her to dump her boyfriend at the time who had been sexually molesting me, if Jesus, whoever this Jesus is, can make my mother come to her senses and leave this man alone, I'm all in. I want Jesus. So when my mother was talking about, you know, Jesus and she was praying and she had this language she was speaking in that she never learned, I was on board 100% and I was one of the happiest little girls on the planet. And so yeah. we started going to church every every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Friday. And my mother, who's a excellent cook you know we started cooking for the churches and I was the oldest child out of five so we started cooking for all these churches and uh, it was it was a mixture of wonderful and not so wonderful because at the same time in the same year um, I was into oldies but goodies and my mother told me that Jesus told her to get rid of the oldies but goodies and I wasn't happy <laughs> I was a little mad at Jesus. <laughs> oh my goodness. But um, but that first year, I it was like heaven. Um, there was nothing anybody could say to me about my Jesus. Because Jesus saved my mama from drugs and saved me from being sexually abused, you know. So I, I it was life changing. And I can understand how when people, you know, get into the, to church and something like that was going on and then Jesus comes along and it becomes all good. I can understand how that happens. I can, you know, and so that went on for about three years. Uh, we ended up in this church with this uh, pastor who had nine children at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard he since had 13. But anyway, um, he had nine children. And oh my goodness, I loved that man like he was my own dad. Now, my mother was a single mom, you know, taking care of five children. So this pastor comes along who has nine children, and I instantly fall in love with him. Now I know it was because of who he was in the pulpit. I've always had a strong just love and respect for people in the pulpit. Whatever they said to me was gospel. You know, it was like Jesus speaking. Because Jesus was using them to give me a message. So whatever if they said jump, I would say how high. I literally followed everything they said. Mm. And um, and I would have problems with anyone that didn't. <laughs> you know, so I remember with him, um, and this is when I started, at, let's see, I was 10, about 13, because that was before we went back to Michigan. So when I was about 12, 13, this pastor friend of ours, who I absolutely loved, him, his wife, his, his children, we hung out together. We had dinners together. We did, you know, our missions work together. We knocked on doors together, talking about Jesus. And then this man tells my mother, who was on state assistance at the time, aid to dependent children back then. And he tells my mother, that um, you save up money and I will take your money and put it on a down payment for an apartment in Texas. So we were all excited. This is way back when. And we trusted our pastors with our lives, literally. Um, there was nothing that that man could have done that was wrong, even if it was wrong to the rest of the world. However, what had happened was my mother, raising five children, managed to somehow save up nine hundred, not thousand, nine hundred dollars, which was a lot for her. And she gave it to him, and he disappeared. Wow. And we had nothing. You know, my mother lost that money and her car broke down. We ended up having to 
moved back to Michigan, which I was not happy about. But it made me start questioning people in the pulpit. Mm. It didn't end there. I forgave like I was taught to forgive, and I moved on. I forgave him 100%, and I continued to love him, even though we never saw the man again in life. We moved back to Michigan, and I think that was one of the worst decisions my mother could have ever made, and I know she may not agree with it, but I do. It was the worst decision, and there's nothing I can do about that now, but I think we walked back into literal hell. So during those times, we found a, a church um, and they became our like our family. But were they really? Because we walked back into an environment that was drug infested. Um, you know, my grandparents were alcoholics. My uncles were alcoholics. It, it was just a horrible, horrible environment. And then long story short, my mother gets in the church uh, to a church there and we go all the time. And it was kind of funny because she decided to ride a bicycle one day and one of the brothers or sisters saw her riding a bike and just let her have it because she had on pants, slacks. And we were taught in Deuteronomy 22 and 6 that a woman is not supposed to wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Well... So we weren't allowed to wear pants and we weren't allowed to even wear makeup and e earrings back then. We, we were in a very, very um, strict church. Mm. But, I, but I loved it. it. It's what I was taught, you know. And so I was okay with it. So I want to see the point to the amusement park with a dress on. Who does that? <laughs> my dress flying all up in my face on the roller coaster. <laughs> Can I can I throw in a question? Um, yes. Yeah. Regarding not just the the actual churches you went to, um, but your like your personal relationship with Christ. At what point would you have said you made an actual per personal profession? You know that it's not this isn't my my mom's savior or my mom's faith. This is my faith too. When did that come into the equation, or was that later? I think you know it was around the same time, and I, the reason why it was around the same time when I was eleven was because we went to the Pentecostal church. So we believed in Jesus. We believed in the Holy Spirit. We believed in the speaking of tongues. But we also believed in healing. And um, and I remember when I was 11, we were at this church and they were doing, uh, We had there, there was a, a revival and people were being healed. And uh, I wanted part of that. You know, I wanted to be able to heal people. I wanted to be able to pray for them and see the miracles happen, you know, and I just believed Jesus one million percent. There was nothing that Jesus couldn't do. Now, here's why I got in so strong and so heavy, because I was a little girl who had crooked fingers and I'm not going to show them, but I have crooked fingers. They're deformed. The only thing I wanted when I was 11 years old was for the Jesus that I saw healing people to heal me. That's all I wanted. Hmm. And I prayed that Jesus would heal me. I pray. I was like, Jesus, you can have my life. I give you my life, but not for the healing because I love you. You know, I see Jesus saving people and people's lives changing. I mean, I see this stuff happening for real. Their lives are changing. My mother was a perfect example. And I, you know, I caught my mother doing drugs many times. <laughs> and I'm like, and that was a bad thing. It, it really was. My mother did some crazy stuff when she was high. So Jesus was the answer, you know, and they had the words, Jesus is the answer. Yep. You know what? Jesus is the answer. I don't care what nobody, Jesus is the answer. You know, so if you're having a bad relationship, and this is at 11, okay? If you're having a bad relationship, Jesus is the answer. All you got to do is pray. You know, if you're you know, not happy, Jesus is the answer. And nobody could tell me that Jesus wasn't. So I was a little missionary at 11 years old. You know, 11, 12 years old, I was, pre I, I'm preaching to everybody about Jesus because I 
believed it 100%. By the time I was 14, though, when we were back in Michigan, my mother, you know, there was one scripture that talks about, you know, you shouldn't be unequally yoked. Right. And I'm thinking, then why is my mother marrying a heathen? So my mother's supposed to get married. You know, she gets to the altar. This relationship she's in is going on a couple of years. She decides to marry this man at when I was 16 years old. And I'm like, this is not making sense to me. What would Jesus say? Jesus would not be happy with this. And I was so hurt for her. I was the oldest daughter. You know, I'm really thinking about her. I don't want her to be hurt. Mama, you can't marry this man because he does not know Jesus. I was hurt. So the man stood her up at the altar after she didn't, we just spent all this money. At that time, I was working. And he stood her up at the altar. I was so broken because I couldn't believe that, number one, Jesus would allow this. Number two, that this man that said he loved her and her children, that he would do that to us. And that really is when I started seriously questioning, not just God, Jesus, but the church. Um, and the church through my mother, because my mother was my God. She was. My mother, you know, she loved Jesus so much. She knew that Bible inside and out. She made us learn them scriptures. We know, the. I still know the Bible from Genesis to Revelation today. Any scripture you quote, I know it. <laughs> you know, so how could Jesus allow this? I was so hurt. I remember crying for a couple months. And then I remember I just wanted to find this dude and just choke him to death. Because how could he do that? And then something else happened. You know, people want to, one of the things I know in our society today, especially here in America, and I hear it out here on a lot of these sites, yours included, where people question our love for God. And I say, how dare anyone question my love for God? When I love I sell my soul to that thing or that person that I love. Literally, I give anything. Yes, I was the one in church crying and loving Jesus and on my knees and throwing my hands up, shouting hallelujah. I sang the songs. I felt the spirit. So but not, no one ever questioned what I loved, what I did, and how loyal I was. I was very loyal and mm. I brought a lot of souls to the Lord. Mm. It really does seem like there, there's just that general background mentality uh, when they look at their worldview and they say that this is the only true truth. This is the only true way. This is the re ultimate reality of what's going on behind the scenes, as it were, of the universe and into looking into eternity, uh, so to speak, that, that, that this God that we believe in is the real thing. I think when you realize that that, cognitive dissonance and that indoctrination is so deep and then when they come across people like yourself and and me and others where we say we left it they're just there's no way for them to compute that maybe they're wrong and for many of them they've truly even if they could say oh, i've theoretically thought about it but they've never profoundly asked the question what if i'm completely and utterly wrong what if this truly is just right. mythology and made up and so they do look at that and say they have to come up with some way and i, I i've come across even this week some list of uh, some preacher put a little thing together of five or 10 reasons that people don't believe in Jesus. And of course, it's all about you wanted to sin or your pride or, you know, you're the Satan got you. And, but they just they can't believe you just simply really, really believed. And then you concluded this really wasn't reality. It's you know, amazing. there are two things that I want to say regarding that. Let's see. The first one is when I got pregnant as a teen. When I got pregnant, my mother got stood up at the altar and I was just, I was devastated, traumatized, whatever words you want to put on it. And I found myself in the arms of some nice, tall, dark, handsome guy that smelled really good. And I ended up pregnant. 
had sex with this dude one time and I had a baby. My mother would not allow for me to have an abortion and um, because of religion. And I had a child. Um, the worst part of that experience is why I became a counselor. My family literally turned their backs on me. And again, I was traumatized because even though my family weren't religious and they weren't, you know, Christians, my mother was. And how could you, knowing Jesus, turn your back on your own child when she needs you, you know? So I had a lot of, you know, stuff going on around that time. But I forgave and I moved on and I had my baby and I moved on and I became homeless with my religious spiritual mother and I still forgave because that's what I was taught to do. I was taught to love no matter what. And so I did and I forgave. And a lot of what I've learned as the Christian is to forgive no matter what sins a person does because God will forgive them. That's the part I have a problem with today. Today, hmm. I give myself permission to not like your ass if I don't. <laughs> Tell us what you really think about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whew, there's some stories I could share when I was doing counseling where I helped free a lot of people because Wow, just wow. We go through so much. And so um, not to make this, you know, an extremely long story, because I could talk for four hours. I used to teach classes for four hours, but I don't think y'all want to be bored with that. So <laughs> um, how about you're a good storyteller though? I like it. You're you're a good storyteller. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but so I think I want to segue into how I got to where I am today. Mm. You know, people think that, oh, she must have been hurt. That's why she don't love the Lord no more. Somebody did her wrong. Well, you know what? Let me just say, I was sitting in church one time as a minister now. I've been ordained by God, just like the rest of y'all. <laughs> so I was sitting there as a minister and we had this wonderful event called Seven Days Seeking God. As a Christian, it was probably one of the most profound, amazing, glorious times of my existence. Because we, seven days, we were praying and fasting for seven whole days. We slept in the church on the floor for seven days. Mm. there was a lot of tears and crying and just amazing, you know, feeling that you get. Y'all, Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. You know that feeling that you get when you're in church and it's like you just feel like the Lord has just come and touched you on the shoulder. Mm, like a true revival. It was like that times a hundred. It was amazing. The music, we played it. Music, keyword, we played the music 24 7. Oh. I sang, um, and it was beautiful. And I remember around my conversion, con deconverting time, and I had, you know, re remembered that, you know, well, what about seven days seeking God? And I think about how we manipulate each other without even thinking about what we're doing. We all, we're still little ids, little babies, still manipulating. You know, when the baby comes, is born, and the baby, you know, gets hungry, and the baby, you know, and the baby wants to sit her thumb or a pacifier or a bottle, blah, blah. We're still little ids, just still trying to manipulate to get what we want. And music is one of those magical ways that we can do that. That music used to work on me. It doesn't anymore. I hear it now and it's like, oh, but it used to be such a part of me. Mm. And I remember sitting in church and this is when they started pissing me off. During 
the seven days seeking God. There's a big name speaker, minister, prophetess out there who stood in the pulpit and she said, lock the doors because the Lord said there's $20,000 more in the air. And I'm like, now at that time, y'all, I was saved, sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost, okay? I don't care what the hell y'all say. <laughs> nice. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, what in the hell did that lady just say? That's called kidnapping. They got all these strong men standing at the door, 12 men. And they wouldn't open the doors until they collected every dime. And I'm sitting there as a minister. And one of the elder ministers looked at me and I looked at him like, like, what the hell are you looking at? I'm not giving you nothing. Because at that point, that point, I realized that I was being manipulated again. Because it wasn't the first time. It's like, they literally just locked the doors in the name of Jesus. I don't think Jesus would be happy with this. And I was, I was living when they find, and I'm sitting there clutching my purse. <laughs> when they finally released them to open the doors, I remember walking out of there with a, a attitude. And it's like, you know what? I have been manipulated for the last time. Well, it wasn't the last time. Y'all know how it is. You forgive and you move on. So a couple of months later, we were having choir uh, practice. And um, and our choir practices would always get filled with the Holy Spirit. We would just be loving on the Lord and just so amazing. And, oh, you know, it's like the angels sang, but it was us singing. It was just beautiful. And a homeless woman walks in with a five-year-old. And the pastor was out in his office. And so the woman comes in and she's crying that someone stole her, her luggage uh, when she was at Greyhound, which wasn't far from where we were. And so the minister, you know, the pastor says, you know, take her in the bag, get a story, blah, blah, blah. So I get a story. And so he whispers to me, Sister Michelle, we're not um, helping her. Just tell her to leave. I'm like, but we're the church. What did Jesus say about the least of these? We, we have to help her. Well, we can't trust her story. She could be a, a crack addict. Jesus wouldn't care. He would take her and heal her and take care of her and the little boy. Again, I'm so hurt. They made the lady leave. She leaves out crying. Hmm. I thought the church was supposed to help the needy. And I just start crying because my heart goes out to people that need. Hmm. I'm a mother, you know, and I couldn't imagine someone turning me away because I didn't have. So I went and followed her. And I picked her and the baby up and I took them to the grocery store and I bought them food. That was my way of being a good Christian, of helping. There were countless women in that church. And we went from, we were one of those churches that was poor. But we went from being 12 members to being over 300 members, 500 members, 700 members almost overnight, you know, because mm -hmm. of that particular time that we had. And the pastor, I remember him standing in the pulpit and he would say, and the Lord don't want so and so and so on happening. And, you know, you should do this and you should do that. And the Lord is not happy with this and the Lord is not happy with that. And I'm like, Wait a minute, he talking about sister so-and-so because I, I just talked to her yesterday. Why is he talking about her business in the pulpit? I was also the pastoral counselor, so I knew everybody's business. Mm. But I would never, I will go to my grave with all of their secrets to this very day. I've always taken confidentiality seriously. So I became a counselor, and when I was doing my internship, the church asked if I would still work with their, you know, their congregants, and other churches would come after me, and I was a uh, acting chaplain, so I got all the, at least 40 churches coming at me. 
I wasn't fully licensed yet, but there were ministers that said these words to me. Can you see our congregants for the Lord and do this work unto the Lord? That was the first time that I defied a minister. And I said, hell no, unless the Lord is going to pay my bills because I got to pay this student loan back. And unless I can get paid to work with these people, I'm not doing it anymore. So I stopped. And of course, I was not a good Christian and I was not working for the Lord. But see, what happened was, and I don't, you know, there are a lot of you guys out there to go through this and you're not saying anything. I was in an abusive relationship with them. Um, I remember, and I'm going to throw this name out there because I love this guy. I remember when Miles Monroe came to town. I love that man with everything. He's the reason why I've owned over 5,000 books, y'all. <laughs> Miles Monroe came to town and everybody wanted to see him, including me. But I didn't get a chance to see him because I was working for the church. And my toes on my right foot went numb. And you know what? Nobody cared. I worked for that month every day relentlessly because I was serving the Lord. And serving the Lord means you get up at six o'clock in the morning and you get to church for no pay. That's serving the Lord. Serving the Lord is you go and raise money however the heck you can so you can go on a missions trip. And we're going to give you the money when you come back and you never see it. That's serving the Lord. <laughs> so anyway you know I'm seeing all this stuff on the pulpit and I promised myself that if I ever get in a position to work with people I would die with their secrets and so I went and became a licensed therapist because that was an education that they could not take from me because the moment that I said no to them guess what they did in their loving way they took the position from me mm. You know, and so I That's realized crazy. that man, the church, can take away from you things that they feel they gave to you. So I decided to go to school and get me a real degree by the secular world and a degree that no one would take from me. There is another degree I have that yeah, I've kind of taken from myself. <laughs> you know, but... um. But my master's, you know, I got my bachelor's and my master's both in counseling and psychology. And I absolutely love the work, but I didn't love working with the people because what I didn't know is I was going to work with a lot of Christians. And it's like, you know, if y'all knew the shit that Christians do behind closed doors, it would make you think twice about life, about Christianity and every other religion. With your story, part of the story about them taking away the position, it really sounds a lot like so many of these stories where you realize it's in many venues, it's about control. It's about, you know, the, the people in power who just want more power, uh, either actual power or at least power over your mind and your, your actions and your purse, you know, over your money. Um, yeah. It's just so much is control. It's crazy. When you really look at it, it's like, this is this isn't about you all getting higher and higher in the church. You can be a bigger servant, so you can have a bigger head and, and a bigger car and a bigger house. I know it's not always that way. There are some very humble preachers, or some humble ministers, or some humble missionaries who are who aren't making a dime themselves. But there's a, a lot of en enough of it that does make you think twice, and 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 to think why doesn't the Lord, if the Lord's real, why isn't He stopping this? Why is He letting so many people on mass be deceived in His name? Mm -hmm. And, you know, he never shows up and says, you know what, there's a real actual problem here. We've got some some larceny. Or we've got some pride, severe pride or hyper control. Right. It's just he never shows up and fixes the problem. It just goes on sometimes right. for generations. And this all, you know, is control in their favor. In every area of your life, you know, and so now I'm going to tell you and I know what people are going to say and what they're going to think when I talk about this next day, you know, because this is how effed up religion has all of us. So I'm going to talk about a couple of things that I think are effed up and I'm being nice saying F instead of what I'm really thinking. Um, When my 17 month old grandson died, he drowned in my neighbor's pool. And yes, you know, 
It was, you know, the neighbor's fault. It was my daughter's fault, blah, blah, blah. That's not the problem. Here's where the problem is, y'all. It's you Christians. This is when I was just on the verge of saying F y'all, your God, your church, and everything else when my grandson died. Because the Christians, a few of them said to me, to my mother so-and-so face, well, the angels were there and they took him by the hand and they took him to heaven. F you for saying that. Or, well, you guys just were just, you worship him too much. You loved him too much. What the, what? Some of the sick stuff that people said to me in the name of Jesus made me hate the, the moment I became a Christian. I am still disgusted by some of the things that people have said to me and my daughter in the name of Jesus. And you want me to love what now? Absolutely not. You know, I, I just, it's insensitive, you know, and it's horrible. Some of the things that people are saying to women that lose their children and they want them to love God and believe that an angel took them by the hand before they actually felt any pain. That baby drowned. He fought for his life. And he died. So. Hmm. I've uh, mentioned this story before, but I, I heard uh, my pastor, the last real pastor I was under, um, he, he told the story of how he was counseling a woman who had lost a baby, I think in the first year of its life. And he actually told her, and he shared this with the congregation openly several times. He's like, I told that woman, ma'am, you need to remember theologically your baby deserved to die. We all do. Every breath we take is a grace from God. Your baby deserves to die. And I just thought, how in the world, like, again, the, the word you said, insensitive on steroids, really, how do you say these things to people and not just feel like the biggest, uh, you know, abuser of this in the world? And then you're going to walk out thinking I've told the truth and I've done right. And it's just, it's horrible. It's truly horrible. And they do it, of course, in the name of Jesus. Right. And, you know, it's, it's, Really interesting that, um, you know, people will take and people are going to take my Christians are going to take my words and twist them up so bad that what they're going to come out with is nothing near what I was saying. And I'm OK with that because there are people that have their eyes open and then there are those of us that don't. And I was one of you. So I get it. You know, if you think I wasn't, I didn't really love the Lord. I get it. But your opinion doesn't matter to me. I love the Lord just like the rest of you still do today. So mm. we never we haven't talked about what was the straw for me. I purposely allowed myself to go to two Christian colleges and universities for a reason. Because I was terrified that I was about to become an atheist. I felt it. I started questioning and I started getting in trouble for asking questions like, why would the Holy Spirit allow that to happen? You know, if God knows everything, I mean, seriously, did God know that I was being sexually molested and he just stood there and let that happen? I mean, I started asking serious questions. But then one day in the Christian school, <laughs> In the Christian school, y'all, I was sitting in my class, and this was in 2002, because it all began in 2002. I was in my philosophy class, and I'm sitting there, and I got my 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 philosophy book. I'm looking, you know, I'm reading. You know, this book was like that thick, and I'm reading. It's like. We were reading about the story of Gilgamesh. Has anybody heard about that story? Raise your hand. <laughs> we were reading about the story of Gilgamesh. And have you ever been in a dark room and somebody turned a bright light on and you go like, Whoa! that was me with the story of Gilgamesh. I did not know that there were duplicates. You know, let me say what I'm going to call, and I know people are going to disagree with this word, but the story of Noah, 
is plagiarized. <laughs> that story has happened before and before and before. Wait a minute. The Jesus story, the Messiah. Jesus isn't the first Messiah. WTF. What? I'm sitting there and I'm, t you know, I know y'all might think that I'm, you know, foolish, silly. I really didn't know. I had never heard of there being other messiahs. I had never heard of that before. I'm telling you, I sat in my class that night and I cried my heart out. Because I'm holding this book of literature that is talking about stories that's thousands of years older than Jesus. And you talk about non-congruency and things not matching and things not fitting together. And it's like, I, I cannot comprehend. I, I don't understand. I was traumatized. I was hurt. I was angry. I was lost. I was confused. And I was a little close to being suicidal. Hmm. How am I supposed to go on living with these lies? Does my mother know? Does my pastor know? How? For days, I couldn't talk. I, I, I couldn't think clearly and I just I was just there in an emotional basket case and I was in a business program at the time and it was not long after that that I switched over to counseling because I needed to be able to help people mentally and emotionally to deal with all the stuff that was coming at them mm -hmm. um, I wish I had known about deconverting I didn't. And uh, I wish I had known because I would have stayed in the field and I would have helped people that are deconverting because it's hard. It is that that is like. If you've ever lost the most important person in your life. You know, a parent, a child, it's like that times 100 because we're talking about your God. God is more important than our mother, our father, our grandmother, our uncle, our auntie, our sisters. Our... God is more important than every human on this planet. Someone, that book, had just literally just snatched God from underneath me. And I felt like I was just floating endlessly. I didn't know where I was going to go, what I was going to do, how I was going to live. I did not know. And I became a very angry person, very angry. So, yeah, you're looking at a woman who's been through a lot of trauma. And the major one is God and my grandbaby. Those were my two major traumas. Because mm -hmm. God was not there for me. God was not there for my grandbaby. God was not and has not been there for my daughter who is still struggling today because it's like, does God really exist? Why would God take my baby? You know? Um, and speaking of, you know, being God fearing, which I was in, in the Christian terms, and I'm talking to you Christians out there, God has taken some of the greatest people from this planet and y'all accept it as, God doing it. No, shit happens and death comes. It, it does. You know, we're not spiritual beings having a human experience as I was taught. We are animals having a human experience, y'all. Sorry. It is what it is. <laughs> mm. so, so anyway, I read a lot of stories and I finally decided that um, I'm not playing games anymore. I'm tired of being nice. And I'm also tired of hiding in this closet. And that's the reason why I'm doing this today. I'm tired of hiding. You know, 
the stuff that I believe today to me is foolishness. Um, but I cannot tell my family members that. And I'm sure once they see this, they're going to still disagree. How dare you say God is foolishness? I'm not saying God is foolishness. You are. You can believe your foot. It doesn't matter. Foolishness is foolishness. I can believe I can fly. <laughs> it's amazing to me, too. I, I think you've made a, a really good point. The idea that there's so much information that Christians are uh, either intentionally or just situationally deprived of, uh, especially the mythology of where Jesus came from. And that was, for me, one of the biggest, not, not the only factor, but one of the biggest things is that yeah. issue of, of the learning where you're like, it, it was like, almost like in, in a couple different stages, it was just like, I was learning new things that were blowing my mind. And, and that was its own issue. And then it was the question of this stuff that's blown my mind. I'm realizing, why wasn't I told this already? Like, why wasn't I told this already? I went to two different Bible colleges in a, a, a Christian mission school. None of them mentioned this stuff, not once. Right. And right. then the third tier was like, okay, this new information, realizing I wasn't taught it, but I should have been, or at least exposed to it. And and then the third issue was you would bring it to Christians and they would be like, I'm putting my fingers in my ears. I don't want to hear it. And I was like, okay, you you don't realize what that last step just did. Like right. you, you, you want to keep me in Christianity. You need to address the information and the issues and realizing that they were just like, there's nothing there. This, there's no man behind the curtain. It's this is all just misinformation or it's a misunderstanding. And I'm like, no, no, but, but let's let's dig into it in depth. And they wouldn't do it. I had nobody and not anyone in my Christian world would truly dig in and look at the information I was presenting. Not a single person. They by and large just ignored it and or, or just gave you a simple, you know, look, God is God. Jesus has transformed my life. And I've been living you know, for the Lord for 40 years. He's changed my heart. He's made my family so wonderful. And if you'll just turn to the Lord in the gospel, he'll do it for you too. And I'm just like, you're you're speaking past me. You're not listening. I'm not saying that the gospel, if it were true, doesn't sound very inviting and interesting. I'm not questioning that the gospel as a story has, has a compelling message. I'm asking, is Jesus mythology or not? Not was there a guy or not? Just is the gospel stories of him walking on water right. and healing blind people, raising Lazarus from the dead? Is that actually true? And for me. Some of this stuff, and I'm sure you've heard me mention this, but like realizing Dionysius, the you know the 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 god of wine, he was turning water into wine and riding into town on donkeys hundreds right. of years earlier. Zeus was crying tears of blood and water much exactly. much earlier. Uh, Hermes was walking on the water and much Tim, much earlier. Yeah. By the way, my fingers are still not healed today. By the way. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. The healings don't happen, and all these mythologies. Uh, Helios, the sun god, wears the purple robe and has the crown of rays, sun rays around his head, and, and Jesus does. And you you go on and on to this, and you're like, there's just this huge pile of stuff that's so obvious. And it's like they won't even engage with it. And that was almost like a double whammy because it was like, you know, Christianity breaks your heart when you realize it's it's not real. But then Christianity, the institution, breaks your heart because your fellow Christians don't give a damn about your questions. Or about the fact that your heart is breaking, realizing it's more likely than not that God, the Yahweh and Jesus aren't real. And so it just breaks your heart all over the worldview and your your institution and your community. They keep breaking your heart. But and you don't know, you don't know yeah. what you don't know. Yeah. Exactly. And like we weren't taught that, you know, that there are other stories out there. You know, mythology was forbidden for me to read it. That was forbidden. You know, my own mother did not want me to go near psychology because she felt like it would make me become an atheist. Well, it wasn't psychology. It was philosophy where I started reading about mythology, you know. And so mm. to me, and I'm talking to, you know, to your audience now regarding another thing that pulled me away from the Holy Bible is that I saw it as a white man's Bible to not only control me, the black woman, but to force me to worship its God. In the name of Jesus, and enslaved me and my people, and we're still doing, going through a lot of shit today, but the molestation that certain churches are getting away with, what? how is that 
holy and beautiful to molest um, children and be okay with it and forgiving them. You know, I think we need to like literally get rid of the word forbid and then see where we'll be. <laughs> exactly. Can I ask with the, the, the colonialism concepts, did they ever show you pictures either in the in, inside of a Bible or on a wall of like what Jesus would have looked like? And, and if so, do you remember what, how they portrayed him? I guess I what I'm getting at is did they portray him as a white man or was it? Yes, just, yes, really? absolutely. Wow. Er, growing up, I never, you know, I didn't see anything different than a white Jesus until I became an adult. You know, it was always the the white man Jesus. You know, and then I'm supposed to be afraid of him and I'm supposed to worship him and I'm supposed to give my life and submit. Because of what? Your color? That's not going to happen. And so I started rebelling. I remember that. You know, I started rebelling because I couldn't understand it. You know, what does race have to do with anything? I, I couldn't understand it. You know, growing up in a poor black church, we were taught almost to respect the white churches. Why? Who are they? You know, so, and that made me question God. So does God love white people more than he does me? I didn't choose to be black, nor did they choose to be white. And then I would be told, you know, again, these are questions that I asked as a teenager and I would be, you know, kind of brushed off, all the, always brushed off. Then it's like, my mother would say, well, God is no respect of persons. Uh, yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. Because there's a poor man over there that has no food. And there's a lady over here who has children who has no food. But then there are these people over here with this church, this multi-million dollar church. That ain't feeding the poor. God is a respect of persons. And he clearly says, you know, that he has his chosen people. In the Old Testament, of course, it's the nation of Israel. And of course, in the New Testament, it's portrayed as if the church has sort of taken over as his, you know, second, second best choice. You know, Israel wouldn't respond to their Messiah. So the church is now it. And, you know, you can, they can argue at that point about what's going to happen to Israel later in the eschatological construct of the end times. But you know, the, the, God does. He it says, I elect people. I choose in Romans 9, he says, I picked this person and I didn't pick this person. You know, Jacob, have I loved Esau? Have I hated? He says, I have, I am the the creator and the master and the, uh, the one that, you know, creates these clay pots. And I have the right to create one clay pot for glory and one clay pot for destruction. Yeah. I'm sorry. And that's I have respect a right to say all that is bullshit. <laughs> exactly. And that's what I say. Absolutely. I, I just, when I hear, you know, like I mentioned before, Tim, I know that Bible inside and out, unfortunately, because I went to Bible school. I became a missionary. I became a minister, blah, blah, blah. Now that I am, the light has come on. All of that now sounds like foolery to me. I can't stomach hearing it anymore because it reminds mm. me of how ignorant I was. Because I was. And I hate that I spent so many years of my life. I feel like my someone had robbed me of almost 40 years of my life. Who would I be today if I hadn't been brainwashed? And in what I now see as a cult, and I'm calling all of y'all churches out there called, I don't care how you think about it, what you feel, it is. We are living in the dark ages if we continue to be living according to walking outside and doing the Indian rain dance. There is no, you can't go and dance and make the rain come, y'all. And I use the Indians because I love their history. I love the stories. I love how they, how they worship the planet. I love that. I used to love reading about them because I felt they had such a strong culture and in my particular part of the world, in my culture, we did not have a strong culture. We were the mm -hmm. black, but our culture wasn't strong. So I gravitated toward learning about the Indians and their culture and, and their spirituality, and I absolutely loved it. But now looking back, 
I am an atheist. And now looking back, it's like, wow. The way Christians and religious and even spiritual people are today, it reminds me of the Indians going out, creating a circle and dancing for rain. That's what y'all do to me. You dance for rain. And if that sounds ridiculous, it is. It's ridiculous. You cannot dance for rain. Mm. But people are not going to wake up after hearing this. They're just going to get pissed off. Yeah. Can I ask just as a related question, uh, you mentioned there the, the the racism and colonialism that's inherent in this, but uh, gender roles, could you just touch on that for a moment? Uh, what, what were the gender roles that were sort of assumed and uh, pushed on you either directly or indirectly while you were in it? And how did your <laughs> perspectives on that evolve as you began to realize that, you know, patriarchy was truly, and, and misogyny were truly part of this equation and that you had to escape that as well? Well, what had happened to him, and I'm going to give you an excellent example. <laughs> Coming toward the end of my Christian walk, I was at this Christian school and Rochester College. Sorry, y'all, calling you out. And they did not and still do not believe in women being in the ministry and being in the pulpit. They don't believe in that. And again, I'm thinking... But God loves us all. Nope, God don't love us all. God just loves the men. Us women are subservient and we are to worship the men. Yes, sir. What do you want me to do next? <laughs> I'm the wrong sister for that, y'all, because um, I was going to this college and I remember one of my assignments I had to present. And I walked in in my ministerial robe, my minister's robe. And you should, the, the looks, they literally sent me to hell with their looks. <laughs> I knew that um, people were going to be very unhappy with what I did that day. I went in and I ministered on the woman in the Bible. And the men in the room walked out. And I wasn't surprised. So, Still to this very day, we're in 2024 and the church, still many of them, not all of them, because some of them are amazing with letting women lead. Some of them are awesome with that because, I mean, I was a female minister, but then there are those, when I became the acting chaplain at the detention center where I was, the men were not happy about that because I was a female. Mm. And, um, and it's like, but God gave men a voice and women a voice. And we are part of you. So why not allow for us to use our voice? Well, God never put a woman in charge to do anything. So they wanted um, me gone. And there's verses that it isn't just a cultural thing. There's verses that directly say things like, you know, women, if you have a question, keep quiet in the church. Ask your husband when you get home and other things. And women should not be preachers. It's 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 in the book. It's certainly in the culture at this point, right? Um, and it's woven into you know even the Old Testament. You know, Sarah calls Abraham Lord or Master. Uh, first Peter repeats it. Says you know, says, I think it's first or second Peter. You know, sits, talks about this wonderful woman Sarah who calls her husband Lord or Master. And it's like this stuff is 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 so deep in there. You just it, it is. It, it's, it's like it, you you see the progressive Christians trying to salvage it. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Like I understand why you want to salvage it it's not really salvageable. Like it's, it's not time to clean this up. It's time to discard it and start with a different worldview. This you stuff know, is just awful. To me, you know, I wonder, and I still wonder to this very day, how do educated people who have been through at least an associate degree, this will boggle my mind. How can you going through liberal arts, having philosophy, still believe in Thor? Yeah, it's, it's like, what, what? Okay, so we still believe in Santa Claus because to me, now looking back, all these fables, all these fairy tales, all of these, you know, allegories, we believe it as real. So why don't we believe in the Easter Bunny? 
I see Easter bunnies hopping around here all the time. It's like we don't see how I think we as a human species could be so amazing if we weren't still living according to fairy tales. Mm. And that makes me nervous. What yeah. makes me nervous is what I see people doing out here in the name of Jesus. That makes me nervous. It's scary that they think that it's okay to hurt somebody because they don't believe in their ghost. And the churches are disgusting to me because when I went to that college, that college didn't like me. They took my money, but they didn't like me. And they literally damned me to hell because I wasn't worshiping God the way they were. And that also made me question a lot of things. How can you not love me? I'm your sister in the Lord, but you're not worshiping the way we do. So you're going to hell. And I was, again, traumatized again. Like, but I, I thought we were serving the same God. Nope. You don't serve God this way. You play music and we don't. So you're going to hell. And it's like, okay, you know what? I'm done. This game is too much for me. It's too much. I can't. I don't have the patience for it anymore. I think one of the interesting dynamics with, with what you're saying too is it's it's kind of crazy to me that Christians don't seem to have the forethought to think about where their actions in these kind of situations go. And what I mean by that is they're playing a short game versus a long game. The short game is they control the power, they control the narrative, they decide if you get to be a pastor, preacher, music leader, they decide if they kind of win this conversation and kind of make you walk away with your tail between your legs. Oh, I guess I lost that one. But they don't realize that people in those cases, yeah, you, you, there, there may have been like a loss in the sense that they had the authority to just shut us down at certain junctures or to say, you know, you're wrong and get out of here. But those people who used to, we used to say those, that's our community. Those are our leaders. Those are our respected heroes. We love this preacher. We love that person. Uh, and in the end, once you realize those people aren't so good, they aren't so kind, they aren't so loving, they're no longer my people. You, of course, do feel a significant loss because you're like, I need a new community. I need to reground myself and, you know, figure out even my own identity. But once you do that, once you get a new identity, once you reclaim yourself, once you get regrounded in your new community, you come back a hundred times stronger. And now, as they say, you know how the sausage is made. I know how this stuff works and I know how to undo the damage you've done. You thought you, you know, shut me down and you sent me away, you know, kind of, you know, in tears almost you shut me down and you thought, Oh, this weak, you know, this weak person is out of the equation. I came back a hundred times stronger and now I'm equipped to help other people escape too. So not only did you lose me, you lost a whole bunch of other people because now I've got a voice and it's stronger and clearer and more articulate than ever. And they're they're playing this real short game and they're not realizing the implications. Like deconstruction isn't a fad. It's here to stay because this worldview doesn't make sense, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think that a lot of people have had time to think. It's like being stuck in a dome, a world that is under a dome. And thinking that that dome is all that exists. That is the world, literally. But then you find out there's this little door over here that leads outside the dome. Oh, no, we were told not to go outside the dome. It is forbidden to go outside the dome because you'll be in hell. You're going to die if you go outside the dome. Well, I stepped outside the dome. And I have absolutely no regrets. I remember the first, you know, time when you know, it's like you're so brainwashed and it's like something happens and your thought is to pray about it. Then when you don't, you feel like you better move because the lightning bolts are going to come. You're definitely going to die because you didn't pray for something. And it's like, it doesn't really work anyway, y'all, seriously. Have you ever seen the Truman Show? The movie with Jim, the uh, the movie the Truman Show with Jim Carrey. Of course. 
I love that final scene where you mentioned the door, where he literally finds the door, like the back exit of the the, the theater, or the stage, whatever you call it, uh, on the other side of that man-made lake. And he literally like, you know, makes his final bow to the camera. And he's like, I'm out. But it's it's a great illustration. Like we really are kept under wraps. And, and of course, the Plato's cave analogy, we were kept in a cave and everything was shadows. Right. Yeah. But when you do a finally escape, I, I don't I think the Christians really don't have a scope for the imagination to realize just how beautiful it is to finally uh, see it, you know, to finally see like, oh my gosh, I've never used my eyes before, like my real eyes. I Now I can see for the first time. And you all made me sing once I was blind, but now I see. And now exactly. I realize I was blind when I was with you, but now that I'm left the church, exactly. now I actually can see. Yes. I remember thinking that and saying that a few times uh, years ago. Actually, the reason why, um, one of the major reasons I'm here today is because this is my 20th anniversary this year. Um, Congratulations. That that I've been free. And uh, thank goodness to the Christian school that I went to and that class that I took, it freed me. Um, I didn't know that I was on this path of, wow, just feeling free and not feeling bound to feeling like I'm obligated to be somewhere every Sunday and I have to go hang out with these people even though I don't like them and I disagree with a lot of what they're doing. I'm free to be me, to love my family. I love my husband. He loves me. We love our children. We are moral people with and without the Bible. I know a lot of y'all think that, why you wouldn't be moral if it wasn't for God. Okay, whatever. You can hold, You can have that. I wouldn't be killing no damn body with or without your God. And I might be thinking about it with your God, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, it's, it's always funny when you do look at the biblical morality, though. You're like, okay, yeah, how, where where in the world would I get my morality if it weren't for a book that tells me to commit genocide, land theft, uh, stoning, uh, have child brides, genital mutilation, and the like, to stone my, uh, beat my slaves until they're almost dead. Like, yeah, where's my morality now? Like, it's just, it's, exactly. it's crazy. Exactly. I know we're uh, almost out of time, but could I ask just maybe as a good wrap-up question or two things? Number one, if there's any part of your story that we just didn't get to yet, please, you know, uh, take a minute and, and fill us in for the final part of your story if there's more. But also, uh, could you just tackle into that maybe just a final word of encouragement to anyone that's kind of in the hardest parts? You mentioned a few parts where it was just like really chaotic and really, uh, you know, difficult to to deal with the, the transition that was going on. What word would you give to somebody besides, obviously, you know, we all agree on some of us need therapy at some of those harder parts, but besides professional therapy, uh, you know, what else would you say to somebody going through the dark stages of this? Well, first piggybacking off of the professional therapy, I would strongly suggest you seek out someone who is a secular therapist and not a religious therapist and not a spiritual therapist. They think they're not religious, but they are. Yeah. Um, I would say, you know what, this walk, I've been on it for 20 years, you guys, and it has not been easy for me mentally, emotionally, psychologically, because there are Christians, they're like zombies. They're everywhere. They're going to get you. (laughs) So how do you deal with it is the thing. Um, If you are to a place where you are starting to question, there's a reason for that. And it ain't the Lord is prompting you or the Holy Spirit is telling you to start thinking about this and that. No, your common sense is finally kicking in and your human nature is finally kicking in. And it's forcing you to start asking some serious questions. Who am I and why the F am I here? (laughs) Um, and so I would say, do what many of us are doing, including Tim, you reach out into the community of people that are similar to yourself. A big word is secularism, humanism, uh, deconversion, deconverting, non-Christian, (laughs) non-religious. Or at least evangelical. Start text, you know, typing those words in on Google and also on Facebook And you'll start finding people that are similar to you. However, beware of those that are like me, because we're not nice to people that are just coming to their senses. Uh, Not all. We're nice. We're nice to them, right? It's just we're 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 we're, we struggle when they try to tell us we're all needing Jesus. Still, if they're coming with humility and saying, "Tell me your story," but if they're saying, "Hey," 
I, I've come here to your Facebook group, but you all really need Jesus. That's where we start fighting. Yeah, you have to understand, for those of you that are questioning your um, your first graders to us, we are in college now. It's like that. So what you may try to talk to us about your God and all that, we've been there, done that, and uh, we're not there anymore. And me personally, I kind of have little mercy anymore when it comes to that. I don't freaking want to hear it. And I will tell you outright, do not come at me with your God. When I meet new people, I tell them, we can be friends if you can deal with me saying, shit, fuck you, you're an asshole, and I don't believe in your God. If you can deal with that, and I don't believe in any God, period. Now, if you can deal with that, we can be friends. What I'm saying to you is it's time for you to find out who the real you is, you know, and when you find that, you don't let anyone shake you from it. Just like in your religion, trust me. You're going to be, you're going to take that religion and become a better and new improved you. That's what's mm. going to happen yep. because I was a strong woman. Then I'm stronger now. And I don't, I didn't take BS back then. I certainly don't now, <laughs> you know, yep. and just go and find you and be yourself, you know, and love yourself even while you're in the midst of this, because it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. This fight, you know, um, in church, we used to talk about the spiritual warfare. That mental game is is, is, is something else. Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> Once you see it, you know, you can't unsee it. And, and it's, uh, that's still part of the tough process. But what's amazing is even though you're you're almost wanting to unsee it, like I want to go back to the simplicity of just simple faith in Jesus. I know I'm going to heaven. I know the gospels, you know, the, the way I've been saved. You want the simplicity of it all and those easy answers. Uh, but once you see the mythology behind it and the reality of the, the Yahweh character's psychopathic nature, that kind of stuff, you can't unsee it. But eventually you're like, you know what? I'm, this was weird stuff to go through this, but I'm so glad now that I know. Like I wouldn't go back if I could. So Tim, and I want everybody to hear what I'm getting ready to say. Because I try to, when I talk in public like this, I try to be as practical and simplistic as I possibly can. And Tim and I are with you in that dark cave right now. See, normally it's y'all think y'all the light. Nope, we the light. We the light. And I want to encourage any of you, if you haven't turned this off yet. <laughs> to, There's probably a few. <laughs> <laughs> to go and research mythology. The one thing that I was told was blasphemous. It's there for a reason, you all. It's because mythology and many of the stories that you will find happen way, 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 many years, thousands of years before your Jesus. I know we thought that Jesus was it and that hardly nothing existed before him. Sorry, y'all. We have been lied to all of our Christian lives. And you can go and let your pastors watch this or whatever. They're liars too. And they're liars because they don't know either. So... We and the thing is, know. the thing is too. Even for those people that aren't quite ready to dive into the mythology, maybe because they just don't know where to start. Um, and and it's certainly you know my channel often directs people to places like, for example, the YouTube channel Myth Vision. It's a great place uh, to start. Uh, but you know, even just starting with the basic questions, like some of the things you brought up, like is where is God when children are molested? Uh, where is God when children are dying of starvation or drowning? But even just the very, even simpler stuff like. Does it really make sense that there's a God, Yahweh, who wants to cut off the end of little boy's penises after eight days? Does that really make sense? Like, is genital mutilation really what you want to base your life on this God who made that a big deal? Or do you really want, you know, every week or every month in your church to have this ritual where you pretend to eat a dead man's body and drink a dead man's blood? Is that really like, are you thinking through this? And I say that as someone that, to my shame, I did not think through that, even though I should have and could have and, and all that. I didn't think through it. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm pointing the finger at myself too, but to step back and say, wait a second, you, even in the most basic stuff of just, I don't know all the other stuff in mythology that you're talking about yet. I do know what I do in church. This character, this Yahweh character does not make sense. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the whole idea of blood magic, you have to have blood to forgive. Why? You're God. You make the rules. Why can't you just say, you know, I just forgive you. Yeah, I don't need blood. That's, you know, I can just, I make the rules up. I'm God. No, you need blood. Why? And why is it interesting that, you know, the Egyptians were doing that stuff with blood magic 
thousands of years beforehand. Oh, come on. No, no. This there's so much more to this. Anyway, I know we're out of time, so I'm, I'm and I know I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, but could you uh, maybe give us one last word, and then we'll wrap it up. At the end of the day, whatever you decide to do, keep thinking. Think about thought and then think about thought again. Why do I think this way? Why do I believe this? Where's the truth? Do you even really know, want to know the truth? Because a lot of us didn't. I did not want to know the truth, to be honest. I didn't. And then there are those of you that hate that you know the truth, but do you? But I do, but I don't, but I do. And so you're going through that mental warfare with yourself. Connect to communities that are similar to you. You don't have to do this alone, by the way. Um, yeah. Tim is always putting up links and he's he always has wonderful people on here. You know, listen to some more of the stories, go to the links, do your own research. Students would always ask me when I was teaching at the university, well, Professor Brown, what about this? And where do you find that? That I'm not going to tell you. Look it up. You're grown. Look it up. Find yourself and find out who you really are. Mm. And if I can uh, venture to quote the Bible as much as we're trying to get away from it, uh, the truth will set you, the truth will set you free. The okay, I'll take will, that one. <laughs> yeah, the truth will set you free. And unfortunately, the truth is not within Jesus or the Bible, but the truth will set you free. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing to uh, to reclaim your identity. Well, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, this has been awesome to hear your story. You've got so you're such a good storyteller again. I love your stories. I love your insights. Um, I really just appreciate your time. But I'll just wrap up by saying we've been speaking with uh, Michelle Brown. Thank you so much. Great to get to know you. Great to hear your story. Look forward to doing it again sometime. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everybody, for listening and watching. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Have a great day. You too.